go. Um, what are some of the tools that you use <clears throat> to try and get people to be able to, to do that? Like to yeah. try and be as effective of looking in the mirror, you know? Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's a great, yeah, it's, this is like depth psychology, you know, and um, it's such a fantastic conversation. And to your, to, to your experience, um, you know, it sounds like you move through something akin to what's called depersonalization or like a derealization where it's like you, you, you see the world of experience, um, but you're kind of like behind this glass wall where it, everything is kind of like happening to you and you're almost developing like a solipsistic mindset where everything you see is an extension of your own consciousness. And that is um, one of the prerequisites to, you know, um, schizophrenia. Is uh, which is so interesting as well because the Hindus talk about how we are all one, and yet that liberates them from their suffering. So I've, I've been I'm really interested in that idea. But you know, it's that everything's happening to me, or we are all one approach. Anyway, we can talk about that for a while. <laughs> um, when we move through, um, you know, existential change, the reason for it, unfortunately is often because we have no choice. So what happened to you is someone coughed at me that matched the description of someone who was positive. Therefore, these things are probably going to happen. And the exact same, um, I write about the exact same thing. The anecdote that I use is that a, a, a loving um, mother and a wife um, comes home to find her husband cheating on her in the book. And um, basically, what I'm, what I'm talking about that and what's happening to you is that who I am is no longer possible. I'm not, I can't be that person anymore. You know, I can never look at my husband the same. I might die, you know, to just go crazy on, on your experience. Yeah. So there is a deep pain that forces us to change who we are. And so often when we are trying to move through change, people get depressed circumstantially because they don't have enough motivation, you know, and, and there's a really great book called Affective Neuroscience, which talks about, um, you know, motivation in mammals. And there are only two systems there. It's pain and pleasure. We run to pleasure and we run away from pain. And oftentimes when we're not changing and we're lost and existential and potentially depressed, it's because those frames aren't explicit enough. So what we need to do is either, you know, if we want to change, so sometimes people want to change and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. So the why needs to be stronger. It's like, well, who do you want to be? What's your idea of a point B? And that's really powerful because it means they're willing to embrace change, which can be very scary because change is also very novel. And when, when we, uh, things are changing around us, anything could be potentially anxiety provoking or dangerous. So we don't like change. That's why we don't like change from an evolutionary standpoint. What you're talking about is um, the pain side of things. I don't want to change, but I can't be that person anymore because my husband's cheating on me. I was caught him in the act. I don't want to change, but I can't be that person anymore because I might have coronavirus. And what's so interesting in the model in the in the in the modern mental health world is that we view anxiety as a bad thing, but it's actually evolved to motivate us to get the fuck away from a saber tooth tiger or from a bear. So we harness it for its power. And one of the things I get people to do is to journal about how bad you know, their life is. And that's a tough, sort of, a, a tough pill to swallow. But under my guidance, you know, this is something that really worked effectively for me. Under my guidance, it's like, hey, you know, we're using this so that we are getting to a more desirable place. It's not just a bad you, bad you. It's we're, we're trying to get you to, um, to make you know, the changes that you want to make. Well, yeah, you got to understand where that where that's rising up from within you, for, and what yeah. reason it is like that because it's not, um, you know, anxiety. I, I kind of use this phrase: you know, anxiety doesn't happen to you; it happens from you. You know, um, and that from you is multi layered. You know, and it's yeah. obviously based upon um, who you are in the past, like your evolution as an individual, your filters, and how you view the world then you've got to relate that to your, your current exposures. Like how bad are they? Why do you react to this versus someone who doesn't react to it and who, mm. you know, all that stuff. And, and clearly, um, you know, I don't do cancelling like you do. So we keep, I keep these conversations to a certain level and then handball them on to the people in my practice who, <laughs> who yeah. deal with this um, more often. But yeah, I find it is that I've, I have been interested in this myself, having a number of people close to me suffer mental health 
um, problems along the journey and, and figuring out how that has come about, like what, what, mm. what part of their life has led them down this path, which is, I had a question that come to me then, but it, um, it's sort of a scammy, but it's just come back again, which is good. <laughs> um, a lot of the people who, are, who I deal with or who listen to this podcast are really interested in optimal performance, uh, um, health and well-being. And so um, mm. they're, if we think about it like going down a road, they're, they're, everyone's heading down a road at some point and quite often um, people derail, go off the road, crash. We can use any one sort of analogy and then they'll end up in our office for some crisis care. You know, they might come and see someone like you to try and get that help that they require. But yeah. obviously if we can stop them from getting that point, it's even better. 